Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Learn to Hunt Pheasants program tonight. Uh, my name is Courtney, and I will be moderating our program. The program will be approximately 30 to 45 minutes in length, followed by a short question and answer session. Before we get started, I want to make sure that everyone can hear us. Please let us know if you can hear me by sending a note in the questions tab found on the right hand side of your screen. You can ask questions throughout the program by typing into this tab. Please note, um, we do have a little over 100 people who are registered for this event tonight, so we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but don't worry, we will send everyone answers to missed questions along with a recording of tonight's program and other helpful resources um, within the next week. So let me go ahead in here and check. Okay, great. It's looking like most of you guys can hear us. Um, so tonight, Courtney Bronze, our hunting and trapping R3 specialist, um, will be our presenter. And if you just give me a few seconds, we'll get started. All right, thank you, Courtney. So I just wanna start out with a little bit of background on ring-necked pheasants. So they're actually members of the chicken family and they're native to Asia and they were introduced to the United States back in the early 1900s. So during this time, the Pennsylvania Game Commission set aside funds to purchase and propagate game. So pheasant eggs were purchased and given to commission refuge keepers sportsmen's organizations, and private individuals who were interested in raising pheasants. And by 1915, the PGC had stocked pheasants for the first time. So during the late 1960s and early 1970s, that population was really flourishing. But by the mid-1970s, the pheasant population harvest trends started to decline. So as farming practices and use of pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers increased, this really took a negative toll on the pheasant populations. So wild pheasants are no longer found on the landscape for the most part due to a combination of habitat loss and the farming practices I mentioned. So I just wanna start out going through some ID. Um, this is a rooster or a male ring neck pheasant. As you can see, they're a really bright, colorful bird. They have these bright red wattles or fleshy parts on their face. And then they have that iridescent green neck with that bold white ring around it, hence the name ring neck pheasant. Their bodies are a beautiful combination of reds and browns, golds, black, um, a lot of different colors there. They have a very long tail. Um, those feathers are coppery in color with thin black bars. The roosters have a really distinct crowing sound. So it's a loud double squawk followed by rapid muffled wing beats that may or may not be audible. And they'll typically crow the most at sunrise and sunset. And then once they're flushed into flight, they'll often make a loud cackling sound. So this is just a picture of one in flight. And then the hens or the female ring neck pheasant aren't near as colorful or pretty as the roosters. Um, their plumage is a subtle camouflaging mixture. So you have that brown, black, and gray. And they have a much shorter tail with thin black bars. So they have this really cool camouflage so that they're able to blend in and hide from predators when they're nesting. And they're typically silent. They don't make any loud calls. Here's an example of one in flight. And both roosters and hens are legal to be harvested statewide during the pheasant season. So the PGC currently distributes over 200,000 ring neck pheasants annually. And these birds are raised on two different game farms within the state. All of these birds are released onto lands open to public hunting. So this includes state game lands, 
um, other state, federal, and county properties, and properties that are enrolled in the Commission's Hunter Access Program. So they're stocked throughout the season. That preseason stocking typically takes place about a week before season starts. This picture here is just an example of how the birds are stocked. So they're transported in these crates that have slats or openings in them. And these openings allow you to see the bird, but also for the birds to be able to breathe. And once the stock truck gets where they're going, the crates are opened up and the birds fly out. These birds are raised in a way that really allows them to adapt well to the wild and be strong flyers. So once they're out there, um, just because they were farm raised, they're not tame by any means. So this, this is the pheasant stocking allocation chart by your region. You can find this on the Pennsylvania Game Commission website. Um, birds are stocked all throughout the season. The preseason stocking, like I said, typically takes place about a week before season starts. And this chart just gives you an average of how many are put out in each region. We're also going to give you the link to this in the follow-up email. This is the pheasant stocking map. It's also available on the Pennsylvania Game Commission website. We'll make sure that you get the link to this as well. Um, there's over 200 stocking locations on state game lands, also um, other public lands, and they're stocked starting in October, periodically throughout December, and then also in January. So we'll go through the seasons for this year. Um, this year, the junior season for youth 16 and under runs from October 8th to the 15th. And then the statewide season will begin on October 22nd and run through November 25th. It'll go out during the statewide deer rifle season and then come back in on December 12th and run through December 23rd. And then it's gonna come in again on December 26th and run through February 27th. So really you have a lot of opportunity this fall and winter um, if you wanna get out there and give pheasant hunting a try. And then the bag limit is two daily and six in possession. So these are the regulations for pheasant hunting. As always, it's very important to make sure that you're reading that hunting and trapping digest thoroughly prior to going out in the field. Um, legal hunting hours are from one half hour before sunrise to one half hour after sunset. There are two Sundays that you're able to hunt this year. That's Sunday, November 13th and Sunday, November 20th. Um, all other regulations apply on these days. If you're hunting in a group, you need to have six or fewer hunters. If you're hunting near a game commission vehicle that is stalking pheasants, please keep in mind that it is unlawful to discharge a firearm within 150 yards of a game commission vehicle that is stalking pheasants. And it's strongly recommended to avoid hunting anywhere near a stalking vehicle. Um, shot can travel several hundred yards, especially when shooting up at flushed birds. And it's also unlawful to shoot into a safety zone, which is a 150 yard buffer around an occupied building. So to pheasant hunt, you need a few different things. You're gonna need your general hunting license, um, it's $6.97 for hunters under the age of 16 and $20.97 for adults. You're also going to need to purchase a pheasant permit if you're not a junior hunter, so over the age of 16. And this permit helps to cover the expenses of raising pheasants and stocking them. It's really a great deal. Um, so a lot of pheasant hunting preserves, if you go there to hunt, will charge $25 to $30 per pheasant that they put out for you. Doesn't even guarantee that you're going to kill that pheasant. Um, so with this permit, you can hunt that entire season for about $27. And just to note that junior hunters don't need to pay for that pheasant permit, but they do still need to get it from an issuing agent. Um, and that's also the same case for mentored permit holders. So it is free, but they still need to obtain a permit. And then senior lifetime resident hunting or senior lifetime resident combination license holders who acquired that license prior to May 13th, 2017, 
are also exempt from having to purchase a pheasant hunting permit. So you also need blaze orange clothing, 250 square inches on the head, back, and chest combined, needs to be visible from 360 degrees. And an orange hat and vest do fit this requirement. However, we do recommend to wear more than that minimum, um, just to make sure that you're seen, especially if you're out there in tall grass, you know, you wanna make sure that other hunters in the area can see you. A vest with a game bag on the back is also great to have. Um, it gives you a place to put those game birds if you harvest them and you can carry them out of the field that way. Definitely not required, but um, it is a great thing to have. You can buy them at most hunting stores. We also recommend brush pants, which are just a thicker material with an extra layer to protect you from briars and brush. And then you're gonna want sturdy boots that are comfortable to walk in. And of course, you also need a shotgun. So you wanna make sure that you have a shotgun that you're comfortable with, um, one that you've shot before that you know well, um, know how to use safely. So there are several different actions you can choose from. This is the break action. Works basically the same way as a door hinge does. To open the action, you point the barrel at the ground and then press a release and the stock drops downward. This allows the shot shell to eject from the shotgun. This action's often selected as a hunter's first shotgun. Um, they're super simple, easy to use. This is a pump action shotgun, also pretty popular for pheasant hunters. And that sliding four stock allows for the hunter to chamber another shell without taking their eye off of the target. And then this is a semi-automatic shotgun, um, also often used in pheasant hunting, allows you to put three shells in it, it'll cycle them for you. Um, also allows you to kind of keep your eye on the target as you're shooting. With your shotgun, you're also gonna need a choke tube. And this is the tube at the end of the shotgun. It's either removable with threads where you can take them in and out and change them, or some shotguns have that choke built in and it can't be changed. So this illustration here shows the different types of choke tubes and what the diameter of a lead shot string will be at different distances. So it goes from the most open or widespread choke down to the full choke. Just for example, if you were to use a full choke, on average, you would have a 40 inch spread at approximately 40 yards. Most pheasant hunters prefer either the modified or improved cylinder choke because they provide the best opportunity for shots that are really close, as well as those shots that are a little further out. So once you've got your shotgun and your choke selected, you're gonna need to select your shells. So for shotguns, it's recommended to use at least a 20 gauge. Um, you're gonna want a larger gauge to make sure that you're not wounding pheasants um, rather than using a 28 gauge or a 410 bore. And there's also the potential for some further shots when you're pheasant hunting. So you wanna be sure to properly match your shot shell gauge and shell length to your shotgun. And then you need to make sure that you're choosing the right shot size. So size five and six is most commonly used because pheasants have a lot of thick feathers to penetrate. And size four is the largest legal shot you are allowed to use for pheasant hunting. And per the regulations, you may only have three shells in the gun at a time when hunting. So you need to make sure you have a plug in the gun so that that's all it can hold. We're gonna include a link to a video in the follow-up email that will demonstrate how to insert and remove a plug. So in addition to making sure you have all the right equipment before going out pheasant hunting, you wanna make sure that you practice. You wanna pattern the shells you're using. And you wanna know their effective range. And shooting clay targets is also a great way to practice. Um, if you have a thrower, the clays kind of simulate a bird flying by. So if you go out in the spring and summer prior to pheasant season and practice this, you'll be good to go come season. So safety is always of utmost importance when hunting with a group. 
um, especially when you're shooting at moving game. So wearing blaze orange is required and important to ensure safety for all the participants. And when moving through tall cover, you want to make sure that you're keeping an auditory contact by talking to people in your hunting group. And then if there's other hunters nearby that aren't in your group, you want to make sure that you're announcing your presence. And you can say something like hunters over here or in the area, just something so that the other hunters know where you are and not to shoot in your direction. Now, as I said before, it's recommended and a good idea to wear more than 250 inches of orange. So now I just wanna go over some of the basic gun carries that are best for pheasant hunting. This is the two-handed or ready carry. It provides the best control, particularly in thick weeds or when you need to fire quickly. If you were to trip and fall, this carry gives you better control of the gun and helps you keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. And it can be used either as a right or left-handed carry. You only wanna use the carry um, when the gun's not gonna be pointed at others while walking. So as you can see, the hunter here has two hands on the gun, the muzzle's pointed to the sky, away from the other hunters. This is the cradle carry. It's comfortable and secure, um, really helps to reduce that arm fatigue. And like the two-handed or ready carry, the cradle carry can be used either right or left-handed as well. You don't wanna use this carry, um, obviously, if the gun would be pointed at others when walking side by side. So just being mindful of safety. And then this is shoulder carry. It's a good choice when walking beside or behind others. So that gun's over your shoulder, pointed away from everyone. Um, you wanna be cautious that you don't spin around quickly and end up pointing the barrel at someone. So the way you line up when you're hunting with a group is also super important. You wanna make sure that you're lined up parallel and everyone in the hunting party has a designated zone of fire. Um, we'll talk about that in the next slide. You wanna make sure that nobody's swinging the shotgun through the line and taking shots at birds that are behind other hunters. And you wanna really try and take shots at birds that flush within close proximity to you. So this photo is a good example of how to safely line up. So the two hunters up front are carrying the shotguns that are parallel. Um, the other guy in line with them who's not carrying a gun, he's probably the guide or a dog handler. And then the two people trailing behind are the observers. So they're just there watching the hunt take place. Um, if a bird were to fly away behind the observers, the shooters should not take that shot. So this slide here is a good illustration of how to line up and make sure that you have a safe zone of fire. Um, so each hunter should be walking abreast of one another. They should be spaced about 25 to 40 yards apart and always in sight of one another. And then each hunter has a zone of fire, which is about 45 degrees directly in front of them. A good way to visualize this is to focus on a distant fixed object straight out in front of you and then stretch your arms straight out from your sides and make a fist with your thumbs held up. And then gradually draw your arms in towards the front until both thumbs are in focus without moving your eyes. So this will give you your outer boundaries. And you wanna make sure that you're not shooting outside of that boundary. So now I wanna move into habitat. So although we may not have the wild pheasant population like we used to, we're still fortunate that Pennsylvania has a lot of great habitat for pheasant populations. So stalking typically takes place in areas that are well suited for pheasant survival. This might be areas with cropland and different types of grasses, or even those edge habitats along fields. So pheasants are even known to frequent wetland habitats. That linear nature of farm fields really makes for efficient hunting. So you have these rectangular blocks of cover that can be efficiently and thoroughly covered by hunters who are organized and prepared. And then a good tactic when working these larger fields is to divide it into blocks and work through it that way. 
working the fields like this will allow you to detect and hopefully flush as many pheasants as possible. So during the early part of season, October and November, pheasants are gonna be found in these agricultural fields. Um, they're not yet harvested yet. Um, you'll also find them in weedy meadows and along hedgerows. But during that later season, like December through February, there's not going to be a lot of cover left in the fields. Um, the fields have been harvested at this point, and a lot of the remaining covers beat down from the weather, um, wind, and snow. So the pheasants will begin to seek shelter in hedgerows, marshes, or places that have thick vegetation. And when it gets really cold, they're going to seek out places or try and break that wind. So during this time, you might want to look in conifer stands too. So pheasants are primarily a ground bird. They spend a lot of their time walking around on the ground. However, occasionally, if they sense a predator, they may take cover in trees. So as you've probably gathered by now, pheasants are naturally going to seek the thickest vegetation they can find to hide in. Um, you might find them traveling in small groups. This helps them to spot predators and find new food sources. And when they're pursued by hunters, their first response is going to be to run away from you and hide. So flushing and flying is actually a pheasant's last resort. Your goal as a hunter is to encourage them to fly so that they give you a shot opportunity. You always want to restrict your shots to birds that are at least head high. So to help with this, you want to be sure to see space between the bottom of the bird and the horizon line. And we'll go more into that in a couple slides. So now kind of getting into some pheasant hunting tactics. Um, you can hunt them with or without a dog. Without a dog, you are essentially the one who's in the field trying to make that pheasant nervous enough to flush. So you're going to want to walk slowly in that field. You're going to want to pause often, um, just like a predator would. And pausing often is going to make that bird nervous enough that they're more likely to flush. With a group of hunters, you can all spread out at least 20 to 30 yards apart. And you want to pay attention to all those really thick areas where a pheasant might hide. So sometimes these thicker areas, you can use your foot to rustle the cover and see if you can flush a bird out that way. Or you can hunt with a dog. Um, hunting with a dog adds a whole new element to upland bird hunting. So that dog is going to be able to use its nose to smell the pheasants and either point or flush them for you. So it's best to try and hunt into the wind so that the scent drifts towards the approaching dog. Two to three hunters per dog is typically a good amount to not overwhelm and distract the dog. And you want to give the dog space and really trust their senses. You want to allow them to use their natural instinct and training to work for you. Um, you really want to make sure that you're taking frequent breaks to allow the dog to rest and be aware of other hunting groups in the area. And you also want to make sure your dog's safe. Um, it's not required that your dog wear any orange, but some hunters will put protective blaze orange vests on their dog. And these vests will protect them from the brush as well as make them visible to other hunters. They also make blaze orange collars. So there's a lot of options out there um, if you want to protect your dog. A lot of hunters will also put a bell on their dog to be able to track them by sound. So when it comes to upland bird hunting, um, there's a couple different types of dogs you can use. There's pointers and flushers. So when a pointer finds a pheasant, they're going to stop and point their nose and head where the pheasant may be hiding. They'll often range very far and wide. Once they find an area where the pheasant smell is the strongest, they point, and then the hunter is able to approach and see if they can flush the bird out themselves. So popular breeds of pointers are English pointers, there's German short-haired pointers, Weimariners, 
um, German wire haired pointers and Britneys. And then you have flushers. So flushing dogs will chase the pheasant until it flies. Um, they're trained to work a little closer. They're very fast. So if you're looking for a very fast moving, exciting hunt, hunting with a flushing dog is the way to go. Popular breeds of flushers are Springer Spaniels, Labrador Retrievers, Cocker Spaniels, and Golden Retrievers. And I think, you know, whether you have a pointer or a flusher, bird dogs are just absolutely amazing dogs. So it's a huge time investment to train a dog to be an excellent dog. And I would definitely encourage you, if you get the chance starting out as a pheasant hunter and you have the opportunity to hunt with a dog, do it. Um, it's a really awesome experience. So regardless of what method you choose to hunt, you want to make sure to zigzag the fields. You want to work your way all the way to those edges. Um, often the pheasants will move to these areas as you push them there. You really want to make sure that you pause often. So this is going to create uncertainty in the pheasant's mind, and that's what causes them to flush. You don't want to move too quickly. So the faster you go, the more likely you are to pass pheasants up. You also want to be prepared for the runners. So a lot of times these birds are going to run away. That's their first instinct. Um, when they do eventually flush, keep in mind that a reasonable range is typically 30 yards or less. And you need to be quick because they will fly away quickly. When you take your shot, you want to focus on pointing at the head of the bird and make sure that that bird is well up into the air um, before you pull the trigger. So it's never safe to take a low shot because you never know if there's another hunter or dog ahead of you. So as you can see in the picture here, <clears throat> this hunter can see horizon line below that pheasant. So that's really important to make sure that it's up high enough. So just some etiquette. Um, if another hunter is hunting nearby and they flush a bird, you don't want to shoot at it. You know, they worked for that bird. They should be the ones to take the shot. Um, if you're entering a field that someone else is working, you want to make sure that you give them space, wait until they're done. Um, not only is it unsafe to have too many hunters in one field, but it may also upset others. So just make sure that you're being patient and cooperating with other hunters. And it's super important to be mindful of where your shot is going to travel. So never take a shot if it's not safe. Um, just let that bird fly and wait until you flush up another one. So hopefully you'll be successful, you'll have some pheasants to process, and you'll find yourself needing to field dress them. So the first thing we do is recommend wearing gloves. Um, you wanna have sharp kitchen shears. Those work great for cutting through the wings, neck, and legs. And you'll wanna cut these as close to the body for the neck and wings, and then right where the leg feathers end if you can. So once you have these parts off, you can use a sharp knife to cut through the thin skin on the breast and pull it back to expose the breast meat. And then you can pull the skin around the remainder of the body to remove it. Then you can make a hole in the skin at the base of the breastbone and use your fingers to remove the entrails. So these paintings illustrate what it looks like to clean your bird. We also have a video for you that shows you exactly how to do the process. So here the numbered illustration on the left shows you the areas you're going to cut. And the illustration on the right shows you what that bird should look like once it's cleaned. Um, pheasants are in the chicken family. So essentially once it's cleaned, it's going to look just like a chicken. So if it's warm out when you harvest your pheasant, you want to go ahead and fill dress that bird right away to ensure that the meat doesn't spoil. And then when you go to cook the meat, you want to make sure you're cooking it to at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're not going to eat it within a couple days, you're going to want to store it in the freezer. And it's best to double wrap it in freezer paper or vacuum seal it to prevent the meat from becoming freezer burnt or damaged. So these are just some recommended resources for you. Pheasants Forever is a really great organization. They have a lot of local chapters across Pennsylvania. 
And a lot of these chapters put on great mentor and hunts. There's also Project Upland. They have a lot of great upland bird hunting information, you know, everything from articles to videos and recipes. And then ultimatepheasanthunting.com also has a great forum where you can ask questions as well as a lot of other um, informative articles. And then also the link for the PA pheasant stocking map. So with that, we're going to move into the question section. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight, and good luck if you get out in the field this year.